Do you have a chef's Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> Um, this session is called Summing Up East Chicago to Achieve East Chicago. And we are joined not only by the three people who are listed in your program, Alejandro Molina, Ron Bailey, Abdul Al Kalamat, but also by Ernie Sanders, who has been deeply involved in smart communities and is now uh, in smart communities in partnership with Connected Illinois and now in Big Square, as we learned today. And Ernie's going to start us off with some summary, summary comments. And then the, the rest we'll hear from the rest of the folks on the panel as they'll move up here. And we want to hear from all of you all. And we have an eye on reintegrating the dis two discussions we had today about local wiki and about the broadband projects. And we also have our eye on East Chicago 2014, which you could say is our first step towards implementing East Chicago, towards seeing East Chicago continue to be implemented as a city out there, not as a once a year conference. So with, without further ado, I will turn it over to Ernie, and we'll all watch from Great. Thank you, Kate. Uh, uh, my presentation is hot off the press. So if there is a typo here or there, uh, please forgive me. Uh, but uh, being here the last few days, I really had an opportunity to learn from each of you and to really understand the impact of this work and, and how important it is. Uh, as Kate said, uh, my uh, work uh, uh, in this field has been uh, very robust and uh, very timely as well. Uh, previously, I worked in the Arbor Gresham community where uh, we were part of five of the communities for the Smart Communities Initiative, which was a BTOP funded program. Um, and it was a really great demonstration project and you know, sadly, I, I had to leave, uh, but when I left, uh, I went into another organization called Partnership for Connected Illinois. They're a state, they're a state, um, a nonprofit that works closely with the state regarding broadband uh, research, deployment, infrastructure, adoption, and use. And uh, there I was the regional E-team leader. I have been there since July of uh, this past year, and uh, sadly again, <laughs> uh, but more of an opportunity, better opportunity came along for me. Uh, today, Mark Ansbury, the CEO of Gigabit Squared, announced that I will be joining them uh, in just a few weeks as their Chicago general manager. And this is a really outstanding uh, project and effort for me. Greg wasn't here earlier. He was <laughs> another, at another event that I should have been at, but I couldn't get there. Uh, and I'm really excited about this opportunity because uh, if you knew my career uh, beyond this, it's, it's, really, it's really a perfect opportunity for me. So uh, what, what I came to, and I'll, I'll, I'll be brief, be brilliant, and be gone, is uh, uh, something that a close friend's dad uh, says, always do, be brief, be brilliant, and be gone. So I hope to do that. I, I, I saw this uh, summit today as a way of creating and fostering digital skill sets that provide opportunities for meaningful use to the community, workplace, school, and home. Meaningful use is a, a term that the government used uh, health care providers, I don't know if any of you know this, there is criteria in Obamacare that talks about meaningful use, right? And health care providers uh, will be eligible to receive funds or tax credits, what have you, if they meet this criteria of meaningful use. And uh, in, my, in my role in community organizing and development, uh, we've all, always sought the importance of not just build it and they would come, but how do we create meaningful use out of the programs and platforms that we present? So I wanted to at least offer that uh, here today. Partnership for Connected Illinois. So if I wasn't going with Gigabit Square, this is what we do. Uh, we ensure that uh, every Illinois has access to uh, and is able to use the broadband at its highest capacity. We collaborate with providers and of broadband to find uh, out what areas they serve and create detailed maps with coverage and areas and speeds. We deploy regional e-teams to convene with government stakeholders and broadband providers to find solutions. And lastly, we promote broadband education and usage 
uh, through programs like the Illinois Broadband Innovation Network. Uh, that's a recent grant that we participated in that we were a grant maker and there are over 113 applicants, 46 were which in my region here in the Northeast area. And out of those 46, we funded four. Uh, and, and helping them to understand what broadband and innovation is and doing some other good things. So, uh, I figured it'd be great to start off with, uh, the, since we're in the land of Lincoln, to talk about Abraham Lincoln, right? Uh, Abraham Lincoln uh, talked a lot about infrastructure talked a lot about infrastructure here in Illinois, and it was so important because he really set forth, the, believe it or not, I mean, everything that's happening now was, a, was based off what this gentleman said, what our president said, what he really uh, thought was necessary here in, in, our, in our state. And uh, here's a quote uh, that, uh, that I found in a recent article. It says, economic development provided the basis, Lincoln said much later, that would allow Americans an unfettered start and a fair chance in the race of life. So you think way back then, and then you fast forward it to today, the comment is still you know, of much value, and it's still of the utmost importance in our work, in our line of work. So, yes, sir. Speaking of that, though, you're aware of Abraham Lincoln. He fought the Union Pacific Railroad all the way to the now. Yes, I am. I was going to it all the way. And then they didn't realize what the number was. They were going to win. So he was the one that got the eminent domain now. Yes. That's correct. That's correct. And a lot of our work, uh, particularly in the broadband industry, uh, is related, uh, has much concentration around the railroads as well. I mean, there's a lot of work, uh, and there's a lot of fiber uh, uh, around the railroads that we could uh, uh, just, you know, increase our, our, our line of work through broadband. So, collective efficacy. Um, this is a term that was used some time ago. Back in 1995, they used this term, collective eff efficacy, to really talk about uh, a reduction in violence in Chicago neighborhoods. Thank you, Kate. And today, uh, um, um, let me move on here. Today I'd like to uh, say to you what I think we can have as digital collective efficacy, and this is my own definition. The digital, digital collective efficacy is the innovation engagement of people, places, and things that has become digitally literate, that help us to, that should become, that help us to become digitally literate and socially responsible while existing barriers to links why existing barriers linked to the digital divide. So I told you this was hot off the press. So essentially what I'm saying here is there should be some collective efficacy among all of us here to reduce the digital divide. Much as there was some collective efficacy uh, started back in 1995 to reduce violence here in Chicago, there should be some uh, collective efficacy around our work uh, to reduce the digital divide. So, I don't know if you can see this, uh, but this is what uh, it would look like. This is a slide that WGN uh, had posted uh, about three months ago, and it, it shows all of the, the touch points when there's high-speed internet. Much of what's been discussed these uh, last couple of days. And so to me, this is an effort towards digital collective efficacy uh, and it really is all, again, centered around high-speed internet. So, how do we, I, I, you know, while all this is important, you know, I, I believe it's, it's really even more important to add value to this. You know, to have some value proposition about our work. So how do we do that? Well, by research. So you, if you look at all of the posters that were out there yesterday, that was research, that was impactful research about our work. You know, I think about the, uh, you all seen the ATT commercial, and the, uh, uh, there's uh, one, there's two, there's uh, sisters playing in the closet, and there's one uh, sister who's about three years older, and she goes, well, back in my day, we didn't have this. And she's just like three years older than her. And you know, it took me the longest to get it. Like, what is she talking about? And I'm like, oh, I got it. 
you know, that this industry is fast growing. Uh, I mean, when was the iPad created? Anyone? Three to five years ago, right? And, and look where we are today. I mean, folks are trying to catch up to mobile devices. Our legislators haven't legislated law uh, yet that could meet you know, the demand that's out there. This aggregated demand is, is so immense. Advocacy. This is another way that we can uh, uh, add value, whether it be at the legislative level or in the classroom. Letter writing, writing campaigns from our students to tell government, you know, hey, we need this. We can create disruptive approaches. Mark uh, get, um, Ansbury talked about it today, about uh, us creating, breaking the norm, not following the old business model, breaking the paradigm, hiring me for crying out loud. You know, I'm a, uh, my background is in supply chain management, and my last 10 years have been in community economic development. And again, that's a creative, uh, dis uh, it's a creative approach towards this model. Developing strategies that retain capital, creating infrastructure projects, and an extension of programming. So John Lewis talked about this this morning, and um, Lubia, Lubia from Instituto del Progresto, taught, you know, the whole, how does my grandmother be able to see what I'm doing, and you know, that whole sort of thing. Just uh, a couple more slides. So I'm thinking that you know once we do all of this, we'll we'll create what's called a digital democracy. It's become you know we have some sustainable outcomes, and in, in the uh, sectors that we talked about today, whether it be healthcare, education, what have you, we're able to leverage resources, whether it be human capital or community anchor institutions. We talked about that, and the citizenship that we create the citizenship where folks start to give back to the community and creating their own best practices and toolkits. Again, our industry is relatively new and the conversation is live and vibrant. I want to leave you with these quotes here. I attended a uh, recent summit uh, a couple of weeks ago in Dallas. This was the uh, National Broadband Summit. And these are some very interesting quotes. Uh, when the Model T was created, did we know we were going to need the Toyota Prius? I was like, whoa. <laughs> That's deep. Uh, why would you need, so this is, the second one is more of a community engagement strategy. Why would you need to drive a Porsche down the highway to pick up your mail? You know, if folks don't know what the Porsche is and the importance of, I mean, why would they, you know, Karen, why would folks want to have a Porsche in rural America to go pick up their mail? So we really need to educate folks about the importance of this, you know, the speed of the internet. The slowest connection you'll ever tolerate is the fastest one you will ever experience. You know, the goal should be not focused on speeds. This was interesting. You shouldn't have to turn your lights off to get to use your toaster. You know, it's more, it's, it's not about, you know, infrastructure. It's about how does this apply? How is this meaningful to our lives? How is what we do really meaningful to the work that we're doing? You must have a vision. Yeah, you must have a vision on how to improve the community before you can offer broadband services. So with the Smart Communities Initiative, we put together a community development strategy. We had a vision of what we wanted. We treated this simply more as a tool in our belt to advance our work in community development. And then with that, I'm going to say thank you. Uh, with, I think I was brief, brilliant, and I'm going to be done. Thank you. Thank you, Ernie. I'm going to get this slight obstacle out of the way as everybody gathers in the front. Could you grab my, my bag right there? Can you join us up here? I, I will. Goodbye. Can you go and sit in this? I'll give you the feed.
we're going to get these folks' thoughts on the weekend, on the on yesterday and today, and we're also going to get your all's thoughts. So we'll just go right down the rows from the Alamantra. Uh, Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you to Kate McDool for the invitation. Um, East Chicago, I think we've seen steadily evolving into a place where we want to be able to have the discussions that are so necessary, both to our digital future and our future as uh, civil society. Um, having said that, I think what, summing up what we think, what directions we should be taking, it's an interesting junction, I think, at this time. There appears to be, in communities, and especially in the uh, broadband, smart communities that Ernie and I have worked in, Auburn Gresham and Humble Park. Um, some profusion of organizations that are looking at or are trying to um, acquire a big picture. Because while, and I, I made this comment uh, during the previous panel discussion, I, I don't believe um, it's difficult to define the moment right now in terms of what communities need in order to move forward. Because the digital divide is not a linear divide. It's not a sequential divide, it's an exponential divide. Okay? And by that I mean, to continue with the horrible metaphor, if the information highway is a series of on-ramps, off-ramps, and the knowledge, because it's not the information, it's knowledge, right? And the ability of communities, much less individuals, to construct knowledge is hampered not necessarily by the dearth of information, right, or the veracity of information available on the internet, it's the ability of a core, right, of an infrastructure, not only individuals, but of communities, both for-profit, corporate, right, as well as not-for-profit, as well as schools, to be able to say to the individuals, this is how we process information and acquire or create knowledge. To me, that's the problem. So. If, in fact, there is a digital divide, we're falling behind much faster. And while Ernie says that it's not a question of speed, speed is important in so much as the digital divide now has different strands, right? Because of the outpouring of rich media, the use of rich media, the amazingly great stuff that's available in video and audio to our communities, not just in the commercial sense that makes us consumers, the ability or the capacity of organizations and individuals in our communities to produce content right, that is part of the self-determination of the struggles of our community is key. And the more we fall behind because of lack of speed or broadband or pipe, the more important the consequences are for the generations to come. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, it's been a very exciting uh, two days, very full of information, very full of uh, inspiration. I want to make a couple of, about three sets of points. One, I just want to, I want to say that the context, the two specific contexts that I speak out of, one has to do with the head of Afro Studies at the University of Illinois and been in higher education and black studies for a long time. So one has to do with higher education in general and specifically how we deal with the town down relationship, how we deal with the relationship of institutions of higher education to uh, our communities and building more effective campus community partnerships in this regard. And secondly, it has to do with Afro-American studies and the focus on the black experience uh, as an area. And for uh, many years, I've collaborated with Abdul and others in doing something we call e-black studies, which has been a dialogue going on at the National Council of Black Studies, the Association for the Study of African-American Life and History to get black studies more involved in using uh, technology. And to relate these two contexts, there's a thing that we use in black studies called academic excellence and social responsibility. So again, the, the emphasis is on doing good quality work, but making sure this work serves the broader uh, community. There have been a lot of themes, a lot of issues in this conference. I mean, there's been a lot of discussion of technology, a lot of discussion of access and training. Uh, a lot of this question of what I would call people in community context. You know, not just people as individuals, but what people do uh, in their everyday lives. And I think one thing that Lubia said in her presentation earlier today was that it's important to connect technology to the lives of people. And I think that theme uh, has been uh, reflected 
uh, in many different ways. So let me just say two or three things um, about things that I want to think about, things that I think we should be in, uh, in, in thinking about moving forward. One, I think it's very important to systematically review the content of this conference. I mean, it's, you know, we've, some of us have been in and out of sessions and so on, but it really is important to kind of go from the opening gavel to the closing gavel, because what I see is that there are a lot of connections, a lot of good ideas that we need to pay attention to. For example, um, Michelle Frisk's presentation on, uh, from the Chicago Public Library on the opening session, that conversation, I see lay out a lot of stuff that lot the Chicago Public Library is doing. And then today you heard John Lewis uh, talking about how difficult libraries in rural communities are having. Uh, and if you put those two presentations together, you're going to hear some ideas that can be used in rural communities that come out of the discussion of what's going on here in Chicago uh, public. I think another example would be uh, something that came up in Lubia's discussion where I think maybe it was Kate that said, you know, grandma in Mexico wants to see her grandchild in Chicago in the dress that she said. Okay, and if you think about that possibility and think about what Dave Finkel uh, talked about with his Youth Technology Corps, Dave has organized young people in his programs to rebuild computers and to raise money and to take these computers to the communities from which their families come from in Mexico. Uh, and he talked about how that not only serves the community in Mexico, but it really is a boost to how these young people see themselves and how they can be involved in uh, the future of technology in very practical ways. Uh, and the last example I would use is Greg Gaither, who gave us a very sharp reminder of what's happening with the juvenile justice system uh, here in Chicago and raised, I think, some very important possibilities for uh, how technology can be used to impact uh, what's going on with the recidivism rate um, and the education of young people who, in a sense, get pushed out of education and have to figure out other ways um, to secure education. So, so that's, that's one, one set of concerns. Um, and I, I want to encourage you, like I do sometimes, actually use the proceedings of a conference like this in your classroom. I taught a course on uh, Afro-Americans in the media in Savannah State. Uh, and I had students after the course, basically the challenge was if you could design a piece of technology to address a community problem, what would that application look like? And they used discussions like this as a way to fuel their discussion and fuel their uh, imagination. And I, I was frankly very pleased but quite stunned at the kind of ideas that I got from this group of undergraduate students about what they saw as being problems and how uh, technology could address these problems. So this is a resource that can be used as a supplement to our classes. There are a couple of three things I want to um, work on as we move toward uh, East Chicago uh, 2014. One is, you know, the role of institutions in higher education. And, uh, I've heard a lot about, a lot about STEM education. There's some really important things going on, um, probably on all of our campuses, uh, that we need to figure out how to better connect to this discussion. Um, I appreciated Adrian's discussion this morning where she talked about evaluation. Uh, there are students in the graduate program in educational policy at the University of Illinois Champaign who uh, are interested in not only they're concerned about technology, but some of them have a particular interest in developing skills for program evaluation. And as I said earlier, a lot of people are going to be doing technology adoption, but to the extent that we can get more people thinking about how effective we're being uh, in what we do, I think, um, the better. I would say the same thing about uh, Karen's presentation in, in rural uh, Illinois. And I mentioned that University of Illinois is struggling with what its land grant mandate should be now in the 21st century when um, you know, it's not as much agriculture as it was, and they're not quite clear. They're closing down rural extension stations and not sure what to do with urban and so on. But, um, making sure that these discussions are linked from you know, the kind of work you're doing at Western and the kind of discussions that are going on uh, at, at, at Illinois. Um, earlier somebody mentioned uh, application development. Well, there are instances where graduate students and undergraduate students are recruited to, to develop 
uh, applications uh, in line with social entrepreneurship? How can they develop something that might serve some of the needs that we've identified uh, here uh, at the conference? I think the, the second thing is uh, I see some things that we should uh, encourage that people model and take up between now and next year. One example, again, I would use is this Youth Technology Corps uh, and looking at that as a way of kind of better structuring and organizing what we can do with the young people that are coming forward um, in our programs. And that cuts across uh, the efforts that have been reported here that have to do with um, recycling youth technology uh, and, and so on. And then, then uh, last, it seems to me, one, one of my concerns is um, what do we do to make sure that more African American communities and more communities of color are coming in uh, to these discussions? And so I'm interested in hearing from people about projects that we might be able to implement between now and next year um, that would uh, that could become models for um, community uh, engagement. Perhaps you know, looking at um, neighborhoods around Chicago and thinking about you know, let's all, maybe there are community institutions in these communities that we should be doing oral histories on. There was an example here where some of the, um, some folks came from the African American Genealogical Society. One guy was a quilter. And he says there's a whole network and community of quilters in the city. So the possibility of doing some uh, oral history interviews with those quilters, he talked about digitizing their, the images of their quilts, and that could become kind of a website and a network that uh, rallies people to better understand this, this important piece of, 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 of our history in terms of culture and the arts. And I'm sure the same thing could be said about music, about other community uh, institutions, uh, and so on. So I think that, that one stream that I would like to work on um, for next year would be um, rallying folks in general, but I think also particularly rallying Afro-American, African-American studies programs. When I uh, lived in Illinois, probably more decades now than I care to count up, two or three decades ago, we taught at Northwestern, we had an organization called the Illinois Council for Black Studies that was statewide, and we would meet around the state. We had an annual meeting in Springfield with the uh, academic vice uh, chancellor of the Board of Regents. Uh, and I look at that, you know, the need to revive that because that can become um, a set of institutions that can work with communities to bring forward, you know, projects to bring forward community people to build collaborations that can create this new stream of information, this new uh, stream of engagement around uh, technology um, in a way that I think would have a very positive impact on the goals that we've laid out for um, for technology in general and in uh, Chicago in particular. Okay. Okay, I'd like to uh, just make a few brief comments. One is to uh, really characterize what we've been trying to do with East Chicago. And uh, I think that it's expressed in the three Ds. Discourse, discovery, and development. In other words, any conference you go to, I mean, it'd be a thousand people, or it could be 60 or 90 people. The question is, how do you, do you talk to really? Discourse. And how many sessions are there that you engage with speakers? So discourse. Discovery, what new information do you get? You know, how many aha moments, you know, go on? And then lastly, as a result of the conference, what happens? You know, when you leave, what goes on? So we're very much uh, into, essentially what Ron was talking about in terms of preserving the record of the, uh, of the conferences. The first three conferences, we actually published proceedings. The last three conferences, we actually have uh, video. And as we've done with this conference, the last couple of conferences, we've actually streamed. And so for the previous session today, there were 60 people observing that session and 60 people observing us in this room. So we had, you know, we got some love out there. We got some people who, who, uh, who shared our conference experience virtually. 
Uh, now, using this approach, we look at the digital divide as the main problem and the way we define the digital divide. Of course, there's access, there's all kinds of things, motivation, et cetera, et cetera. But the, the fundamental thing is most people that go online download information. That was, in fact, the only thing you could do in the Chicago Public Library up until very recently. The real digital divide is uploading information. And the contradiction in that is the masses of people are uploading tweets, but people are not uploading term papers, uh, family uh, genealogical records, et cetera, et cetera. That's the direction that will take cyberspace away from the military, the corporations, the government, the big institutions, and truly democratize it. So what we're talking about is getting people to be uploaders of information. Now, <clears throat> I want to now go to uh, an invitation, speaking on behalf of East Chicago. We are very interested in East Chicago becoming uh, more than it's been, even as it's been very good. And so to accomplish that, I want to announce that we're inviting the local wiki network to share our East Chicago 2014 by having a national gathering of local Wiggians. That's number one invitation. Second invitation to my brother right here, who is now the head of an organization that's going to be putting online and mobilizing people on the south side of Chicago. And what we want to do is to invite er uh, uh, Ernie here uh, to use East Chicago 2014 as a gathering, much like there's been a gathering of people from the libraries, which has been very important. Not only the cyber navigators, but librarians who were to understand the dialogue of the community because they're a digital institution, but they're part of the city that's becoming an information city. East Chicago. So again, inviting Ernie to use this conference to consolidate a discourse, a dialogue. We would go further and say that for several East Chicago's, we've invited the BTOP projects in the state to come. Now one of the things that's happening with BTOP money is that most projects, unfortunately, are folding up their tents. Money runs out, grant is over, end of story. This is a serious question. And so what we want to do is to invite, uh, through Partnership for Connected Illinois, to everyone that's involved in these projects to continue to come together to share our information and to work toward the kind of statewide integration of all the networks which again, doesn't exist. That was not the money that came from BTOP. BTOP established sort of a patchwork throughout the state. And the state of Illinois tried to bring some more money. Then there, there were already some infrastructure, but a lot of this infrastructure was like uh, the dark fiber that apparently was running down King Drive on the south side, uh, that now it's gonna be lit up with uh, Gig Square. Well, that's true all over the country. There's dark fiber all over. For example, there's a big pipe running through Kankakee. The people, you know, in Kankakee had no access. There were no on-ramps. Mm. So anyway, the point here is that we want to take this conference, which is a unique conference, and there are no, as far as I know, there are no other conferences like this, that would bring together people that are interested in juvenile justice, that are interested in the actual reality of bringing the city online, the state online, and giving people the capacity to have free web pages, to unleash people to create digital representations of themselves, of the movement that they're in, of the communities that they live in, of the experiences that nobody cares about except us. You know, I don't think there's a person that lives in any community that reads a daily newspaper that every day says, this newspaper is about me. I mean, I read the New York Times, and I look at most of the crap that's in the New York Times, 
and it's frivolous discussions of people that have tremendous amounts of discretionary income. It's almost an insult to read it. Uh, and uh, that, in, in, in fact, let me just say this, it beats down the consciousness of people in the country that constantly have to worship the kings and queens that are essentially naked in our eyes. And I want to say that clearly because what we're interested here in is the voices of people who have been silenced. Incidentally, that's most of humanity at this point in history. So anyway, the bottom line here is that if we can bring the local wikians together, if we can keep the BTOP people together, if we can get the gigabit square, the new money coming after BTOP in this conversation, keep the library here, bring the schools in, we will have an unprecedented discussion of democracy. And it seems to me, in this post-industrial moment of Chicago, uh, this is really what we need. All right, at this point, I'd really, we'd really like to hear what you all think about the ideas that are presented here and your reflections about East Chicago generally, and I'll sprinkle my comments in with yours. So, what's on you all's mind? Yes, we need a mic stand or something. While you all are starting to think, warming up to open your mouths, um, I want to say this. The, the digital divide was a, was a term conceived in around 1995 when, when Gore and Clinton were at, at working on it. And sometime later it was discredited by Colin Powell's son who said, yeah, there's a digital divide. There's also a Mercedes divide. And I think, I think that one's equally important. I wish I had a Mercedes. Now, the reality is that digital inequality and the digital transformation of society is taking a long time. And I just want to express how that's true for a very rich, although they complain a lot, a quite rich institution in Illinois, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, is now undergoing a new strategic plan under new top leadership. And they have linked their IT plan with their university plan. It's almost like it's one plan because they understand that whatever they're doing to transform the university is powered by IT. If they're not alert, it'll be, it'll be led by IT rather than by the university. These two things are all rolled up into one. So it's like the U of I at Urbana-Champaign is undergoing digital divides and digital transformations still, right? 18 years after the term was, term was coined. So of course, our local communities and all the institutions that Abdul enumerated that we want to get involved in East Chicago or that are involved in East Chicago are as well. So um, it's non-trivial, but the other thing is that the excitement generated by IT is part of the wave that all this other social transformation is riding. So the survival of small farms that Abby is working on this year um, is connected to their take up of IT, their effective take up of IT. Um, the library's continued survival and thriving is, it, is, it is dependent on its connection with effective use of IT by its patrons, let alone its staff, and the development of new services, and the continued existence of our communities, whether they're rural ones that are losing population, or their communities, urban communities, right, that are facing the arrival of Walmart, like the South Side is, and the final death knell of, of, of all local services that used to supply shops, I mean, that used to supply what Walmart's going to start to supply. Local wiki is, is in some ways a response, a way to gather up the online identities and the online activity of all that locality that needs to survive if we're, if we, if we, if we're going to keep our communities from being paved over if we're, or if we're urban or abandoned and, and turned back into woods if they're rural. So, um, I don't think we can underscore enough how important the E is in transforming Chicago as a city and our other, our other localities as well. So um, I'm kind of thrilled at our continued participation in seven years of eChicago and so many people online today that, that we certainly weren't expecting to back up the participation that was face to face yesterday and today. So um, again, I really want to encourage comments and summations and questions from folks on that side of the room. Yeah, Roberto. Why don't you take this one and move this one around as you all talk? 
Well, maybe yesterday I didn't see the whole picture, and you can correct me if, if I'm wrong. But yesterday I saw your your bunch of students, your 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 group of beautiful library grad students, and man, I looked at it, and basically racially, it's very homogeneous. There was really no in a city like Chicago. I would think that there would be more Spanish-speaking librarians or Asian librarians working in Chinatown, but when I see your crowd, it didn't look like it. So I'm not sure whether you can address that or not. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd really like to. Um, one of the things that I'm very proud of is the origins of eChicago at Dominican, which has overcome the diversity problem a lot better than the U of I has probably because it's geographic proximity to a much more diverse population, because the more diverse the population is, the less it's able to up and travel to school, and the more it has to commute to school from, from people's current jobs. Um, so the interest in, from Dominican uh, in re-engaging with East Chicago starting next year is really heartening, because we at Illinois need to learn from schools like Dominican that have made that turn. Um, the other thing I think is that if we have um, any groups that are not diverse, they absolutely have to be here and start listening to Latinos and African Americans and Asians and, and understand that they may be going into a very rural community, and I'm sure Karen would underscore this, but when they get there, they're gonna discover, you know what, it's not all white there either, because the world has come to the United States, whether it's, whether it's Chicago or Peoria or Springfield or you can get to all kinds of nationality groupings that live in the small towns of Illinois. Um, so um, I would say yes, we want that diversity, but we want all those people who might feel undiverse to also be here and to listen and learn. So. I think there's a, there's a pipeline issue involved too. I, um, I haven't had a chance to talk to Karen yet, but I, I found out that 35% of the entering student body of Western Illinois is African American, mainly from Chicago. You know, and while most of the other institutions don't have that statistic, there are a lot of students from Chicago of all nationalities who spread out from Chicago to go to schools across the state. So I think part of our mandate is to one, maximize the contribution that we can make wherever we are in the state to training our entering class at 2030 or whatever the date is, number one. And number two, make sure that the students who go from Chicago or anywhere else in the state get the support and nurturing they need and get introduced to these issues of the role and impact of technology so that they can see themselves as playing a positive role when they come back to Chicago or go to wherever they go. So I mean I think the diversity thing cuts a lot of different ways. And you know, we can obviously use some of these technologies to make sure that people have you know, exposure in a way that might not have been possible at some previous uh, point in history. See, I, I want to make a comment about the diversity thing, too, because uh, you can take two perspectives. One perspective is we can see the lack of participation by people who perhaps should be the most interested in such an activity. And we have to explain why not. And the first thing we have to reflect on is the barbaric racism that has historically made even institutions like this, the University of Illinois, relatively speaking, not hospitable institutions. And by the time Latinos and blacks get to Mumbai or Western or wherever, even the ones that come in at a relatively remedial level have aspirations of being inside the box. There are many other, majority other, who are out of the box, and they know they're going to be out of the box. The school to work bridge has been broken. Of the 53 schools that have been closed in Chicago, 80% of the children are black and Latino. And the community knows that. Now, Every instance of literacy and uh, education and so on is an attempt to see how many people can be socialized to get inside 
the box. The reality is, is that we want to create exactly what the rich and the famous have. They don't have to go to work. And the people inherit. Their issue is, what is our quality of life if we are excluded, by whatever means, from work? I explained earlier, I came out of a steel worker's home. You know what I mean? Where you get up and go to work early in the morning, and when the breadwinner is sleeping, you, everybody in the house, you better shut up because that is our survival. That's over now. And so we have huge numbers of people who are being marginalized, etc. Now, how do we go out and reach them? It's not the bridge to work. It's not straighten up and you can become middle class or you can become like me. That's not it. It's how can they take this technology and transform it and make it something that is meaningful in the context of their lives. Then we got something. So take hip hop, for instance. Where did hip hop come from? It came from the very community that was deeply divided and it's the only global culture. I mean, other than Mickey Mouse and Hollywood, how they mashed it on everybody. But I'm talking about the willful adoption of something. Hip hop went everywhere in the world. And nobody has acknowledged that that's the biggest development across the digital divide because all the tools they use are digital tools. So we've got a society that sees this community from a perspective that creates a very narrow path of the few that can be, but everybody's under the regime of that dominant point of view. We have to flip that script. That's why the local wiki is the bomb. In other words, everybody can digitally represent themselves without anybody else having control. Go to Wikipedia. They might bounce your stuff off because <laughs> you put it up about yourself or the information you put is in the notebook is notable enough or whatever. So we're about flipping the script. We're about talking about information revolution because the capitalists have created information revolution and their information revolution created the digital divide. Because the digital divide is a business model. Let's be clear about that. So we're talking about, as information revolutionists from below, that was the beauty of BTOP. Except if we don't grab this opportunity to make it work for us, BTOP will simply be what? An investment that will then be turned over to the telecoms. That's what we're facing. Remember the railroads. They gave land to the companies that charge us now to ride. They didn't pay for that land. So here come broadband. When, uh, what was that vice president? Gore. It's an interesting name, Gorey. Gore said what? Information superhighway. No, I can go out on the damn ride free. He should have said, an information new railroad. You got to pay to get on the railroad. So here we have, again, conceptual lack of clarity to mobilize people, but it leaves the people behind. It's the people. You got to have love for the people. And if you don't have love for the people, any model you come up with will be nothing other than line them up, clean them up, and see whether or not the mainstream will approve of them. That leaves most of the people behind. The people are the only ones that will approve of themselves. Anyway, look, I'm a teacher, but they always say I have a little preacher. But yeah, anyway. <laughs> Adrian, and then I want to ask Philip to say a few words because the the clear concept of, of, of today that's being laid on us is the local wiki. So Adrian, please. So, so uh, Ron talked about program evaluation and that's kind of what my work has been on. And I just wanted to say <coughs> that personally this has kind of opened up my eyes because when you look at program evaluation, we look at um, what are the mandates of that particular program. We don't, um, which kind of sets those standards and those desired outcomes that they want to achieve. So with BTOP, we're looking at economic outcomes, how many people getting jobs and uh, 
uh, increasing education and those types of things. And we're not necessarily, it's very uh, one way. Uh, how many people are able to now use this tool to get information and not necessarily to interact uh, that two-way um, exchange of information that you guys are talking about now. Um, and that's just really um, an aha moment for me to kind of understand ways in which um, BTOP and programs like this can kind of stimulate that activity um, and ways that we can kind of capitalize on that and how can program evaluation kind of capture that if that's not what we're really looking at and it's not really the intent of, of the program itself. Um, also, you talked about um, hip hop, which I'm sorry, that's kind of brilliant to me. How hip hop transcends this digital divide and how we really just kind of overlook that. Um, and really, I was in another conference earlier, um, it kind of gets to this point of, you know, when we talk about using the internet, we want it to be for something like pr productive use of the internet. So I'm going online um, for some educational purpose, or, you know, I gotta get information for healthcare, or wanna contact my local congressman, or, you know, look for a job. But we really kind of overlook social media as this, um, and even entertainment now that, I'm aware of as a way in which that can also be really useful um, to kind of create that uh, democratic technology that we're talking about here. So um, I just wanted to say thank you for that. Um, and you know, I really appreciate it being here. I didn't get the opportunity to go to all the panels, but just hearing what you guys are saying, I'm thinking about that even in my own research. Um, preparing for my dissertation and research that I'm doing now and how can I uh, better be able to capture what externalities and spillover effects uh, these types of programs have. Yeah, I think, I think the thrust that you're saying is it's not about evaluating our programs, it's about, about evalu evaluating society and where it can go, where it needs to go, and being and intervening in that, which is Philip Newstrom. So I'll hit it. Yeah, I just wanted to say that, uh, I mean, it's been great to have this sort of little mini gathering here and uh, I guess to be able to share some of our stories and experiences uh, working with local wiki. It's also really incredible just to hear for me because, I mean, I'm local wiki 24-7, right? Like, I've been doing this since 2004 and so it's all what I, I love. I love hearing other people talk about it and talk about their experiences because for me it's like this self-evident thing back in my head. This is obviously where local community media should go. This is the future of local public media. Um, but when I when I hear other people talk about it, it, it really helps me you know, pull myself back and say, you know, this isn't just a crazy delusion that I have, um, which is just really fantastic. And that's been one of the great things about going to Oakland, uh, living in San Francisco, and hanging out with people there. I always kind of just try to hang out in the back and let them all talk and like listen and absorb that. I always learn so much uh, hearing, you know, what, what is it, why do people care about uh, a project like Local Wiki? What is it that excites them about it? Um, you know, is it the ownership? Is it the you know, collaboration? Is it the community? Is it the preservation of knowledge? You know, um, and so that's that's something that's, that's I think, been particularly valuable here. And um, yeah, it would have been great. I wish I had more time to try and get more people to come out here, but unfortunately, I was completely slammed. But yeah, I mean, it would be, it would be amazing. We just want everybody to know that Philip, who is personifying local Whitney somehow, gets a lot of love in East Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> the Twitter feed today was completely, completely pro-local Wiki. I, I want to mention something that we we um, we often think about the Googleization of life, right? That, that everybody, when you go online, it's to go to Google, and Google takes you everywhere. Well, the only reason Google can do that is because there's lots of other places on the internet that weren't created by Google. And um, I want to propose that we think about the wikification of life instead, because there was a huge, there continues to be a huge controversy about Wikipedia, right? It exploded, it grew exponentially, it grew in many languages. And then there was this debate, oh, you can't use it to write a term paper. Yes, you can, no, you can't, yes, you can, no, you can't. And we get graduate students who think it's off limits. Whereas our reference librarians understand that if you have a question at your reference desk, 
try to find the answer on Wikipedia first and then try somewhere else because Wikipedia is so rich, it's so constantly updated. If there's an error or someone's trying to play a prank on Wikipedia, it's usually pretty obvious and you can get to the good information, if not on Wikipedia, then through Wikipedia. But local wiki is the Wikipedia for the communities which are the concern of East Chicago and which are the concern of folks who come to East Chicago. So I think that, that we have to see that the local wiki occupies a space that Wikipedia can because lo a lot of local people are not going to put information up on Wikipedia because it's become pretty complicated because it's been under attack. So it's had to use footnotes everywhere. It's had to challenge entries that aren't footnoted and don't provide citations. Well, local wiki is more casual because it's more local. It's more like the, local, the sidewalk instead of the uh, National Library or something. Um, so uh, we, have to, we have to resist the Googleization and move to the wikification, I think. And, and that, if we do that more effectively, that's actually going to flip even local wiki. Because local wiki is, at, at its early moments, what we found in Champaign-Urbana was very text-driven. Because the people who were doing it were students who have to write all the time. But when we reached further into the community, suddenly it was pictures, suddenly it was video. And um, one of the most dramatic examples of that was when it went into the Spanish language. It was full of video about the migration experience. And I looked at it like, wow, I said, this doesn't pertain to Champaign-Urbana. And then I corrected myself, oh, yes, it does, because people are migrating to Champaign-Urbana and then back to Central America and then back to Champaign-Urbana. Mm -hmm. And their stories needed to be told. And so the video was the way to tell those stories because the literacy rates in those communities are lower. And so YouTube and visuals on, and videos on local wiki are relevant for that crowd, whereas the highly literate crowd wants to read text. And so we have both in, in, the, in the wiki world. So I think I want to also invite some comments from Noah, who's an old hand at uh, Wikipedia, at, at uh, eChicago, and then <coughs> all on you next. So stay tuned. Um, yeah, so I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's great. Um, I mean, I think one of the other things about eChicago is uh, it's just a, a dose of optimism. I mean, I think um, sometimes uh, when, we're, when we're kind of doing our own thing, it can be easy to kind of drift into cynicism a little bit. So it's just uh, it's kind of breaking the optimism and the energy that comes from a concept like this to try to uh, take some of that back, back with us. So I would, I would charge everyone to hopefully be energized by the conference. Um, I think that's something that, uh, so, so keep coming back and you know, keep getting energized. So that's one, one message. Um, um, I think um, I think it was really uh, I mean it, it was really great just um, the, um, the serendipitous uh, meetings with people like uh, Professor Bailey talked about um, um, meeting Mr. Groves, the African American quilter who came with uh, the genealogy society. So that's kind of the network. So I invited someone from the African American genealogy society to come to the conference, and they sent it out on their So they brought about half a dozen people from this society to the conference, and then, then we met up with this quilter, and so now Professor Bailey is thinking about the, the network of quilters in Chicago. So that's, I mean, so it's, that's another thing that in Chicago, I mean, it, 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 there's, there's, there's networks and connections that kind of come out of this conference that, that really are things that we need to we need to pull out and make, make visible and articulate and, and, and build on for, and, and so I think these are, these are some of the things that I think make, make concepts like this really valuable and, and important. Okay. And just to yeah. follow up on that point, um, one of the most active members of the Illinois Council for Black Studies 20, 30 years ago was Annie Harris, who went, was at one point one of the leaders of the Genealogical Society. And so that was a way of reconnection. And you will find that you'll meet people up again, you know, through some of these new connections that you'll meet people again that you've worked with in the past through some of these new connections and networks that we're developing. Mm -hmm. There's just a couple more people that I want to invite some comments from, and that is some new people, namely Karen from Western Illinois and Erica from right here in Chicago, right? Mm -hmm. So just your reflections on the day. Um, well, just to, to, to add to the discussion or, or to give you something to think about, um, I came sort of representing the world of Illinois, um, which is a lot more similar to urban Illinois than you probably expect. Um, rural areas are becoming more diverse, 
slowly, but they are becoming more diverse. Um, we, I talked a lot in my session about the loss of population to the youth in, in rural areas. The only reason it is not worse is because of immigration um, and that, that population is becoming very important um, in rural areas. That's, that's our future um, to a great extent. Um, and the, the issues that, are, that we're facing in our communities are very similar to the issues that, that are being faced in, in, uh, in, in the urban area. And um, we're struggling with the same things. And Thank, thanks for coming. Hi. Um, I just wanted to, um, gosh, I mean, I really have no idea how much work and brain power and just awesomeness went into this entire conference. Uh, just two days um, of just inspiring research and just presented in such an interesting way. Um, I really, there, I, every session was fantastic. Every session I attended was fantastic and I wish I could have attended the others. I can only, Thank, um, they were fantastic too. <laughs> <laughs> I can only thank these um, students who videotaped and streamed this whole thing so that I could watch it later. And East Chicago has always um, transcribed their uh, their uh, conferences, so I've been able to read um, East Chicago before I had even attended. Um, mm -hmm. It's how I learned about the Cyber Navigator program mm. and um, reading about it in East Chicago. And then I had uh, the privilege to uh, become a Cyber Navigator at Chicago Public Libraries. Um, and then coming back to East Chicago again, uh, you know, in 2013 and seeing uh, poster presentations about Cyber Navigator experiments in China. Wow. Awesome. <laughs> Just amazing. Um, yeah, and uh, you know, uh, this the broadband sessions sound like they just seemed fascinating, and I really wanted to attend those. But um, I'm really happy that I attended these wiki sessions, um, as Chicago Public Library will be experimenting with um, wiki software uh, to you know share what we're going to do with our our summer learning program. Um, so I'm really, uh, I was very fortunate to attend these wiki sessions just to see what um, some models that have been, you know, already implemented and successful, um, and then, you know, just taking that back uh, to Chicago Public Library uh, this summertime um, and just seeing what our wiki will evolve into um, mm. based on our, our community here. So, uh, yes, just so inspiring uh, this conference um, you know and really I've made I've met some awesome people I've met uh, people from China and <laughs> and I've met people from uh, California and um, just all over and it's just great that we can all all come here and share our ideas and really the more the merrier so um, but yeah, oh, also, um, really, I, um, you know, librarians are activists, and so I'm always interested in learning more about uh, e-governance, digital democracy, and how we can, um, you know, get people to participate. Uh, and really, I think these wiki spaces would be, you know, a great place for people to have discussions or learn about, like, you know, where uh, these community groups are meeting. I think that um, with social media and these wiki spaces, leaders in communities could emerge, um, you know, as, as political leaders who might not have had money to campaign, you know, in the, the campaign, campaigning is incredibly expensive um, just because of marketing and tours and all that. But, you know, really social networking is, is its own form of marketing. Um, that doesn't require as much as much capital. Um, so I think that uh, oh yeah, you know money money capital. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think that you know um, where East Chicago is going um, is 
uh, the right direction for digital democracy and seeing um, you know, political leaders who actually care about communities. So, yeah. I just want to mention a couple of things and then I'm going to turn it back to Abdul. One is that eChicago has uh, given birth to eBeijing. So not only have we exported the idea of cyber navigators, we've also shared the idea of an e-city e type meeting. And the other thing I want to say is that come November, we will be able to set a date for eChicago 2014. We already know the place will be the Chicago Cultural Center, which is not only beautiful, it's also central and neutral, and a lot more people are going to be able to come. Um, and it's also going to be free, so we'll actually be able to afford to continue to have eChicago. And um, oh, wow. so thanks again for, um, thanks again for coming, and uh, over to you. Okay. Um, this brother here gave three points. Be brief, be brilliant, and be gone. <laughs> so I have a proposal for all of us, and it's the concept that uh, we've been using for several years now called the word circle. Be brief, the word circle is everybody here gets a chance to say one word. Be brilliant. This is your summation of the conference, or your sense of where we're going, or maybe your annoyance, or whatever it is, but it's one word, and be brilliant about it, and then we can all be gone. <laughs> so I want to, first of all, find out how we can document this. Now the process is we all get up, and we form a big circle, and we're holding hands. So the energy is flowing in one unbroken circle. And each of us then says one word to everyone else as a summation. And the magic of this, every time we do it, the magic of it is when we have all those words and we read them semantically so they have meaning, it's a poem. And it's always like, wow. And so we want to try that. So now how are we going to record this? You got that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> Everybody, stand up. Yeah, we don't need to start. <laughs> now, the point is, listen, now it is possible to repeat a word, but uh, be thinking of two or three words, but whatever words you think of, probably somebody is going to say it. And we're going to start. With Kate. <laughs> okay. Well, wait. We're gonna wait until we get. <laughs> Can you give me your pinky? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, urgent. 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 Opportunity. Connection. Responsibility. Equality. Inspiration. <sighs> <laughs> um, uh, excitement. Cohesion. Um, Arab. Global. History. Collaboration. Inclusive. Futuristic. Resource. Empowerment. Revolution. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. All right. <laughs> Everybody a link to that being read as a poem. 